Hello again, folks. Today we're going to be starting with a new chapter. Um, officially, it is chapter nine. Uh, it is entitled Trigonometric Equations and Identities. I was I abbreviated there. <clears throat> Section 9.1 is the only thing that we have today. Um, here's the calendar, as always. Um, it's a little bit of a misnomer, so I didn't write the title. It says solving, but you know, the real, really solving is going to occur in section 9.5. This is sort of setting it up to solve, more or less. So um, today we'll do 9.1 and then we'll do the actual solving on nine uh, in section 9.5. Okay, on December 3rd today. Um, the packet <clears throat> looks like this. Uh, the two new pages, and really what's most important, are these, this first page, which describes um, the procedures basically for performing, verifying or simplifying, which is really what we're doing. There is this overview sheet, which I'm going to have you sort of, uh, sort of uh, chop up a bit, because it's giving you too much information. This is going to be one of two sort of master copies of master overview of the identities. Uh, and we'll go through them between now and, um, and, well, technically chapter 10 even. Anyhow, some of these you have seen before, like basically the information from here to here. All right. uh, from uh, Pythagorean identity down to technically these reciprocal identities. And these quotient identities, technically, too, this one and this one. Anyhow, um, what I included was uh, old information that you already have because it will be uh, brought back for this purpose. Factoring is a technique uh, that will still be employed eventually. Can I get into a little bit of it today? Um, the rules of exponents, especially this one, product to power rule, sort of Product of power rule in reverse that gets used a lot. And, and that's it for right now. Okay. So have I'm gonna try to print those pages just to have them on hand, especially the identities page. This one. Okay. Let's see. Put that aside. Here's an overview of the section. In section 9.1, uh, there are two things primarily we will do. Uh, you're going to verify uh, that one side of an equation is equal to another side of an equation. That is why it is entitled solving equations, but it's not exactly the same thing. Verify using identities. Simplifying. They're really the same process, it's just sort of a or a different uh, from a different perspective. Okay. Now what you could do, um, as is often the case, right, when you're verifying um, and you have something that somehow involves an equals, so it technically is an equation. Um, if you wanted to verify that one side of the equals is equal to the opposite side, when you have essentially something equals 
something else by virtue of the fact that there is an equal sign in between them, it's an equation. Right. And what you could do is graphically verify. And in that case, what you do is um, taking your TI-83 or 84, Use the y equals button. Right. One half of the equation will be the first y, and the second half of the equation will be your second y. And if in fact they are the same thing, they equal each other, right, what you should see is uh, the same, uh, each half produces the same drawing. It's kind of a cheat, but it does work. Um, really, the essence of this section is to not do it that way so much as to do it. Um, I'm a little reluctant to use this phrase because we're talking about transcendental functions, but the process is still algebraically. And in that case, this is a step-by-step -step process. Um, this is it as summarized as I could conceive of it. Right. Um, let me not choose that. Choose this. Separate here. And then lower the camera just a wee bit. There we go. Right. If you're going to verify, or even if you're going to simplify, algebraically, um, you're going to work strictly on one side, right? and it's usually the more complicated side. The one that's ugly. Um, if it is possible, right, you will factor, you will square, right, we will add fractions, right. um, and maybe if having done that or not, you will substitute identities. And if all else fails, and you may end up doing this even still, um, you're going to convert to sine or cosine. And I just emphasize, you're going to be on one side, the ugly side. You're going to try to factor, usually, that's the first thing, or these other techniques. All right. Uh, you will substitute identities, or you will convert to sine or cosine. Okay. This is more or less, you know, what you find here on this sheet. Right. I'm just kind of squeezing it into a diagram here. Okay. So. Um, Let's do this now. Let's uh, delineate, chop up what is relevant from this page. Okay? Um, here, I'll show you my own. Basically, I would highlight these three. The Pythagorean identities, these three here the even-odd identities, which I broached last time, and the fundamental identities, which are kind of a hodgepodge, right? These, which are evidently sort of fraction-like, those are reciprocal identities. These particular two, 
all right, or technically the quotient identities, and they are very important. So I put them in a box, right, just to emphasize. Tangent of theta is the ratio of sine of a cosine, and being that cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, it is exactly that upside down, cosine over sine. So I would uh, circle those or encapsulate them somehow to emphasize their importance, all right. These do, although we talked about them, the co-function identities, just simply saying that sine and cosine are out of phase by 90 degrees and so forth. They have been discussed already, but they're not really relevant right now. Then there's this even odd identity stuff that is important. These two are even, and these four are odd. So maybe just chop it up that way, All right? What's important about this is just telling you how you could rewrite something. If you see that you have a negative angle, a negative input, it will nonetheless produce the same result as a positive. Okay, same for secant. If you have a negative input, you still get a positive output. These other things, on the other hand, a negative input for sine, you get a negative output for, uh, for sine of theta, All right, and so forth. All right. So those are important. And this is basically chapter 9.1, what is relevant. Just to remind you, I mean, I probably have to play this, um, about the Pythagorean identities. They come up a lot, so let me just sort of walk it through that. you of where the Pythagorean identities originate from. It's more or less this train of thought. There's the Pythagorean theorem, famously a squared plus b squared equals c squared, right? The dimensions of a right triangle. They don't have to be labeled this way exactly. But to me, it's logical to make the bottom the B, right? And the, the side here, more or less the height of it, the altitude, if you will, A. And this is just C sticking with it, right? These two are legs. This is a leg, and this is a leg. And the one thing that is non-negotiable is the dimension across from the box, which is the hypotenuse. You could swap out the numbers here and here, but the C has to be hypotenuse. If you take a unit circle, oh, I'm gonna use my stencil again if I could find it. If you take a unit circle, superimposed upon a coordinate plane, by definition, a unit circle is at the originates from the center, so zero, zero, the origin, and the radius is one unit, whatever the unit happens to be. So that means it's one unit this way, and it's one unit this way, and as you go around the circle, no matter which point you're at here, it's all gonna be a maximum of one. Now, if you were to extend, uh, sort of rotate through a number of degrees between zero and 90, 
right? Um, you're still on the edge of the circle, of course, and therefore the distance from here to here is still a radius of one. But what ends up happening is that you develop these uh, side dimensions that are really the legs of a right triangle. So just to emphasize that much of the original amount of one, and now this height here. An angle formed in there has, let's call it theta, because it's just a personal preference, it has um, the side dimensions have relationships to the angle and vice versa. So opposite of it, in this orientation, which is basically standard position, is the equivalent of saying y. Right? And adjacent to this angle is saying x. Right? So if you wanted to, you could basically just change the labels. That's the train of thought here. Uh, label change. So instead of calling it A, B, and C, you might call it um, Y, X, and R. Right? If I'm sticking with the, uh, the idea of A being vertical, then Y would substitute for that, right? I like to put things in alphabetical order, and you could if you wanted to, but I'm just trying to be as uh, consistent as possible. So, in place of A, we have a Y. In place of uh, B, we have an X. Right? And in place of C squared, we have an R value. Right? Which is going to end up being 1. Right? If we're talking about a unit circle, right? It is in this incarnation of the Pythagorean theorem that we find a lot of practicality, right? I'm trying to figure out what the ratios are uh, for sine or cosine or tangent or anything that we'd like, right? To remind you, right? Maybe I'll put this in green here, right? Trig functions like sine are ratios. So the sine of theta, whatever the angle is, is opposite of the hypotenuse. And the cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. The green is the sort of die here. Right. Um, in this orientation, from the, uh, the angle here, not there, say, um, we could change the labels for, you know, X's and Y's again. So opposite of this particular theta, in theory, is uh, Y value. And adjacent to this particular value is X. Remember, it just goes from here to here, though. Not the full radius. So X and the hypotenuse is R in each case. Now, if again, we're talking about a unit circle, the radius is going to be guaranteed as one. So this reduces to just simply y, you know? And the same thing here, this is x. Which means that, again, in the case of a unit circle, all right, we could substitute what y equals with a trig function we could substitute what x equals with a trig function, cosine. So you put sine squared of theta. And the, the preference is usually to put the two here, even though technically it would be outside the function. Plus cosine squared equals one. And that is the first of three uh, Pythagorean identities, which really technically has already been brought up. Anyhow, the other two are derived from the process that we're talking about today, which is to manipulate the complicated side.
Okay. So let me show you that because it is going to be useful. say hypothetically that um, we had started with this. Sine squared of theta plus the cosine squared of theta equals 1. I would go through this process even if you have um, the the handout on hand, it is certainly useful, but only for the reason that as we do the examples that follow it, it kind of helps if you recognize what the logic is. So I'll humor me, and I'll uh, derive these other two real quick, or as quickly as possible. All right, basically, if we do to this Pythagorean identity what we're going to do to a lot of individual unique problems today. Which is start with the ugly side and try to make it less ugly, less complicated. We could manipulate this so that it potentially takes advantage of some other established identities, say these ones down at the bottom here, the reciprocal identities. It takes a little familiarity, of course. Right? And remember, I can only get away with doing this if I'm consistently doing it to both sides of equals. If I multiply this entire thing by say sine squared of theta, which may seem a little arbitrary, but you'll see why I would do that strategically in a moment. That will distribute to each of these terms, including the one here. And what you would get as a result is ratios that look like this. may seem like, well, congratulations, you know, you've, you've made it worse. <laughs> and I'm already kind of defining my own instruction, which is to say, oh, we're just going to stick, stick with the left side. True, all right, in this particular example, all right, but the, my logic is still correct insofar as it is the ugly part that I'm really trying to manipulate. That's just a gravy, if you will, you know, a little extra. Now, what happens when you have something ugly over itself? It's sine squared of theta, right? And that may seem complicated, but it's something, whatever it is, divided by itself. What is going to happen 99.9% uh, .9 of the time, with the exception being zero here? It becomes one. <laughs> so if the one that was here is still here somehow in some incarnation. This here, we could um, tangle with it by moving the squares out where they really ought to be. This may be overkill, but I like to go step by step. It makes me feel more comfortable, and I hope it does you as well. If this is being squared independently of this, then in summary, what we could say is that this is the quotient um, uh, let's see, quotient to power rule. This is what I, the reason why I included these old rules of exponents here, which I will point to. It's kind of in reverse. The quotient to power rule. If you have two things, they're different bases, all right, but they each have the same exponent, all right? Normally you start with something encapsulated, like a fraction that's raised to an exponent, and you, you apply that to each of the, uh, the bases. We're sort of doing this in reverse now. 
So I'm going to take these two things that are squared and write the two here, right? How come? Because I am older and I have some experience established already, I recognize that this ratio of cosine over sine is another way of saying cotangent. So taking advantage of this relationship, cotangent of theta is equal to cosine of a sine. I'm going to change that to cotangent. Right? And if it's just raised to a two here, then it would be cotangent squared in a more concisely written fashion. So I have one plus cotangent squared of theta on this side. And on this side, I'm gonna do something very similar. You could skip steps, but to me it would be more careful, all right, to do it this way. The number one is a perfect square. So if you wanted to write this as one squared, it's not hurting anything, right? It's just illustrating the relationship of this number being a perfect square. Anyhow, the nature of it. A similar thing to have happened here, which is that, okay, well, you have two things that are being raised to an exponent of two. Well, then I could write them like this. One over the sine of theta encapsulated and the two is on the other side affecting both of them. This, again, I recognize from what is established from a few uh, sections back. All right. This is officially a reciprocal identity. All right. This is what you might call a quotient identity if you wanted to be technical. That is good to know, right? At least have the, um, the, the diagram on hand. What is one over sine? It's an alternative way of saying cosecant. That is the definition of cosecant. It's the invert, pardon me, it's the reciprocal of sine. So if this is really cosecant of theta and it's squared, then it's squared, right? And that gives us a second Pythagorean identity, right? One plus the cotangent squared of theta is equal to the cosecant squared of theta. That will come in handy. Right. And you can have these realize, of course, uh, with the terms in a different position, cotangent first, if you like or the equation manipulated so that one is on the opposite side, in which case it would be minus. A similar uh, effect would occur if you started with this but decided to uh, apply one over uh, cosine squared. So if you had, again, sine squared of theta plus the cosine squared of theta, is equal to one. And firstly, looking at this ugly aside here, deciding that you want to um, simplify cosine squared. The only way that you could do that is if you multiplied it by its reciprocal. So it might seem a little um, uh, arbitrary to just rip one over cosine uh, squared out of nowhere, right? But strategically, it's for this purpose for reducing this to one, right? Before the purpose was to reduce the sine squared to, to one. We have to be consistent though. If you do it to this term, you must do it to the first and you must do it to one as well. And the effect is this. Sine squared of theta over the cosine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta, which was really what I was after over itself, is equal to one over the cosine squared of theta. This one reduces to one, because even if it's ugly and complicated, assuming it's not zero as a denominator, it's something divided by itself. And as a rule, that is one, All right? This could be reduced to sine over cosine, right? Which is a quotient identity that isn't cotangent, it's tangent of theta squared. 
And a similar thing over here. If you wrote this as 2 and that is a 2 to begin with, then just paying attention to what is in red now. 1 over cosine is another way of saying secant of theta squared. If you just write it in stylistically a more uh, fashionable way, right, the 2 would be here and the 2 would be here. All right. And then you have a third um, identity for reference. You have tangent squared of theta plus 1 equals the secant squared of theta. All right. These three are good to know. Right. Now and into calculus as well. Okay. Um, let me remind you of something about even and odd functions and then we'll do some problems. These get to be fun, I mean, I mean that in earnest after a while, because it just sort of reinforces the truth, you know? Some things that are not evident just by staring at them, when you start out with something ugly and complicated and you reduce it down to the opposite side of the equation, you go, ah, I see now, after having done it several times. We, remember we have, um, this is old hat too. Um, graphical symmetry, right? We had discussed earlier. I mean, like, you know, chapters ago. That's one thing that is, especially as a person in the position of instructor, right? One thing that is appreciable about math, right? And it should be to a student eventually, too, is that it's very repetitious on purpose, all right? The things that you started with, the developmental fundamental material, gets revisited cyclically, you know, each chapter, because math is uh, very derivative, right? The, the foundational information is never irrelevant. It's always relevant somehow, even in an obscure way, all right? Graphical symmetry, when I'm talking about things on a coordinate plane that are symmetrical, Right. We have said, well, there's, in, in the more plain way, horizontal symmetry. Right. And then there's, this is a little bit more complicated, symmetry about the origin. Right. Um, Horizontal symmetry means, you know, uh, when something is reflected over the y-axis. Right. Uh, symmetry about the origin is two steps. Right. This is when something is reflected over the y-axis and then the x-axis as well. Famously, these are irrelevant now in the sense that they are not trigonometric, but here's an example of each of those two things. Um, the function uh, y equals x squared. Um, which would just be a parabola, right? This is something that has horizontal symmetry because when it is reflected over the y-axis, it looks exactly the same. Right? If you spun this around, this point would be here, and this point would be here, and it would be identical before and after. All right. The alternative name for things that behave this way is that these are even functions. 
And notice that the degree here is 2. If you had something that exhibited symmetry about the origin, it's just the one degree higher, really. Uh, y equals x over 3, uh, x to the third, rather. It's a cubic function, which is kind of like half a parabola this way and half a parabola that way, right? Sort of these staying alive poles, right? So if you reflected this point firstly over the y-axis, your point would be there, all right? Uh, right there, approximately, right? And it wouldn't look the same. This point would be over there. It would be backwards. It would be the mirror image, right? But if you then took the time to reflect it over the x-axis as well, right, then each of these things would be exactly in the same place. And you would have the same graph before and after this sort of transformation, right? And this would be an example of an odd function. Notice the three there is odd. All right. Anyhow, that's looking at it graphically. What will be probably more useful will be um, to look at it more or less al algebraically. In, th in that case, I would say um, when you have a situation, I need the space, unfortunately, so I'm going to erase this. You don't have to, I'm just going to erase it. When you have a function that is equal even in spite of having a negative input, right? what happens when you have uh, a negative that is squared? You end up with a positive anyway, right? So in this situation, Even if you have a negative input, the output is positive. All right, so you end up with the same function, basically. Um, in the case of an odd function, um, there's two ways you can look at it. Either you want, you could look at it like this as a function is equal to the negative of the function with a negative input, or probably what would be more useful in this case would simply be to say this, the function uh, let's see, with a negative input is equal to the function with a negative output. These are the same thing as just having manipulated this with the negative is here. All right. Um, so, uh, odd, if you have a negative input, this produces a negative output. Make that distinction between this and this. Start with, uh, even if you have a negative, you end up with a positive. In this case, if you have a negative, you end up with a negative. Uh, famously, if we're going to leave algebraic examples and go to um, <coughs> uh, what is relevant now, right? cosine is an even function. is an example of an even function, right? Because if you notice in the diagram, if even if you had a negative input for the angle, right, the effect is that you would have a positive output. Okay? So associate cosine with even, even in spite of the fact that there's no degree involved yet. It still has horizontal symmetry, so it has that behavior. Um, sine is an odd function. There are, you know, four of these and two of those, but uh, these are the mo most familiar, right? Sine and cosine. If you had a negative input, right, you end up with a positive output. 
So associate this with odd. Right. And you can test the theory. If you take your calculator and um, go to y equals and you type in cosine and you just get it to graph cosine. I may have to back this off a bit because it zoomed in too much. Zoom in. I gotta set my axes. Just being a little jerk today. Um, yeah, let me set my calculator to radians firstly. And then I'm going to go through the manual and verify that the conditions are negative 2 pi, positive 2 pi, a half pi, uh, and the increments of y, it should just be 1. y minimum will just make negative 3, and y maximum will make positive 3. Now I'm going to hit graph. There you go. Here's cosine. Notice where cosine starts, right? At zero x, it's one, right? At zero, at, uh, at x one, or what this and technically is uh, pi over two, all right, it's zero, right? If what we're saying, we, the royal we, is, is true, that if I uh, enter cosine with a negative input, right, it should produce the exact same picture, right? So underneath this, I'll just enter cosine with a negative input. And there should be just one graph drawn on top of the other, so you don't really even see any changes. Right? There you have it, it's the same picture. Right. Right. Anyhow, um, again, on your sheet, right, make this distinction. Right. Cosine and secant are the even functions, and sine and the uh, tangent, uh, cosecant and cotangent are the odd functions. Even though they don't have a degree of three or two or what have you, all right, they are affiliated with those types, those degrees, even and odd, because of their symmetry. They have horizontal symmetry or symmetry about the origin. basically going to be doing this, verifying, following this procedure, and simplifying, which is really setting up an equation to be solved, but not really doing it today because it's a different section. So, um, erase this.
Um, let's try verifying graphically first. Which is kind of cheating, but hey, whatever. Um, cotangent of theta, it's just a skill using a calculator, of course. 1 over the tangent of theta. Um, remember, the trick to this is to, if you want to prove that this is equal to this in the very literal sense, just say, all right, I'm going to get my calculator to draw this somehow. There's no tangent button on our calculator. So what we will do is we will resolve this with um, a quotient identity. All right. Cotangent is the reciprocal, pardon me, it is cosine over sine of theta. So we could type this in place of y1 and see what we get. So, assuming that you are in radian mode and you have manipulated uh, the um, maximum and minimum to be 2 pi, negative 2 pi, and then the y's to whatever would be convenient, I use negative 3 and 3 myself. Right? The increment I would make pi over 2. Right? This is the ratio. It might be not visible because it's too far away. So let me see if I could uh, go out here and see if it compensates. Now it's being a jerk. Here we go again. Oh, I didn't write anything. Jeez, I'm not even taking my own advice here. Excuse me one moment. Jump in the gun. Negative three. I'm putting my um, axes back at control here. And now I'm going to type uh, cosine of x divided by the sine of x. Do I have that? Hit graph. which is what cotangent looks like, right? It is very similar to um, uh, you know, tangent, except that it's more or less the mirror image and it's phase shifted. So if you wanted to, you can hit trace and just verify that. I don't really want to barrage you with this, but uh, notice that at zero, there is no value given for y because that is an asymptote, right? If this is pi over two, and then this would be a whole pi, if you enter, pi again, you should see the exact same thing, that you get a no value for the y value because it's an asymptote. See? Very good. All right. Now, um, if I went back and did the same thing, but used the tangent function instead, right? one divided by tangent. And I hit graph you see that you see exactly the same cotangent uh, graph. Trace, at zero there is an asymptote. This is uh, an issue of the software, so there really shouldn't be here at y is, uh, pardon me, x is equal to pi, 3.14 right here where my, my middle finger is. But because of some minor software issue, it may give you a value when it really shouldn't. That's not anyone's fault except whoever programmed it. Now, it, it compensated, so very good. I remember a week or so ago, I had that issue, and I'm like, why is it that they... Because it, it seemed to me like two different people were the programmers, and they didn't talk to one another. Anyhow, let me uh, do something here real quick. <clears throat> 
let's do this algebraically now. Sort of, uh, I don't want to say, I don't know, tongue in cheek is the appropriate uh, um, idiom, but uh, it's algebraic in that it's borrowing a technique from algebra, which is substituting. You know? But we're going to be substituting identities. That's really what I mean. Um, let's say that you had the tangent of theta times the cosine of theta is equal to sine of theta. Right. Uh, remember, as a procedure here, work the more complicated side. In our case, it is consistently on the left, but you know, depends on who wrote it. So pay attention more or less to just this. You're gonna turn this into that. Somehow, right? You don't have to start dragging things over there in the normal way that we would. So, um, we're going to try factoring, it may be more than that, but when we factor things, right, that would be isolating each of these things in their own little parentheses in the most superficial way of factoring, right? Tangent is something that could be substituted. Tangent, if you look at the handout, is again, if you're not going to use a reciprocal, and it wouldn't be practical in this case to turn it into one over cotangent. All right. um, if you look at this quotient identity for tangent, it is the ratio of sine over cosine. That's basically its definition. So we're going to take this particular factor and we're going to substitute an identity that's practical for this reason to convert to sines and cosines. So if I take this and go, well, it is the ratio of sine over cosine, then by virtue of the fact that this is sitting next to it, it's more or less a fraction-esque looking thing times a second fractionist looking thing. And what can you do with uh, like uh, factors that are diagonal to each other? Well, they essentially cancel, right? which leaves you with sine over one, which is superfluous, right? What is left over here is that this is really sine of theta, which is the sine of theta. I don't know why I wrote one in script, <laughs> the other one not, but so be it. It's the same thing. It's kind of a fun exercise in logic. Here's a more complicated one. It will just incorporate maybe uh, extra identities. So if you started out with this, uh, one plus sine of x instead of theta it doesn't matter times one plus the sine 
of x with a negative input is equal to cosine squared of x. Now, arguably, which is the uglier, more complicated side? And I would say this one just by virtue of the fact that it's binomial-esque sort of fact in CF. Okay. So, and of these two, one of them has a negative input. So when you see a negative input, think, ah, even odd identity. And then refer to until you, you have it internalized, you memorized it. Go to your even odd identities here and see what the relationship is. If you have a sign with a negative input, so negative theta in this case as opposed to x, what does it equal? A negative output. Because it's an odd identity. Sign is an odd identity. So this is the effect. Everything else is the same. I should stick with one style of writing it for it. Okay. Now, interestingly, I have 1 plus the sine of x in this binomial-esque factor. And then I have 1 minus the sine of x from having made this alteration, recognizing that this is an odd function, that this is the effect. Negative input produces a negative output. They're equal, all right, if this is written this way. If you, in some parallel dimension, saw this, maybe, all right, what would this remind you of? It would be kind of written backwards, all right? But this is a situation in blue here and red and black that simulates the difference of two squares model for factoring, right? That is why, again, I uh, figured I should bring this up, right? When you factor, and I use days and b's in my model here, you see that you have two things separated by a minus, and they may potentially, or maybe not, be written with exponents of two. They would factor this way. But what if you started with this? If you needed to, you could write it like that. This is more or less moving backwards. You have two terms, one in, in one binomial it's positive, and in the other it's negative. Well, that's basically what we have here. One uh, situation with a binomial-esque thing is separated by a positive, and in one instance is separated by a negative. So, what is written here, I could write as if I foiled it. One times one is really one squared, isn't it? Um, and one times negative sine of x would be that, and then foiling this would be positive sine of x, and then sine times sine would be sine squared of x, and again, I'm not changing the styles of my s's intentionally, it's just I'm losing my mind. A positive times a negative is a negative. What happens as a consequence of doing that foil is that the terms in the middle here being equal magnitude, opposite sign, would naturally cancel out of existence. And you would be left with one, rather than saying one squared, minus sine squared of x. All right. This is a Pythagorean identity. All right. It's just manipulated. Here's that page to confirm. The Pythagorean identity that involves sine and cosine is usually written this way. Sine squared of theta plus cosine squared of theta is 1. But what if the sine were moved to the opposite side? It would be 1 minus sine squared of theta. And what does it equal? What's left behind here? Cosine squared of theta. So 
this, although it might be a little obscure, is in fact equal to cosine squared of x. Right. That's this thing here. So it confirms. Right. It verifies. It is confirmed. Here's an uglier one. Four. Secant squared of x. Uh, well, I'll take it in this case. Minus one over secant squared of theta is equal to the sine squared of theta. Okay, now again, choose the ugliest side, and again, I would argue that this is the more complicated of the two, because it is a, a, a ratio. All right, let's attempt to factor this somehow. All right, that could just mean doing that, all right, if necessary, wrapping a parentheses around something, and then recognizing it for what it is. This is a Pythagorean identity, it's just written in a funny way, maybe. Here's the three Pythagorean identities. All right, the one that involves secant right, is, uh, in this instance, it's secant minus one. It is as if you had moved the one from the left side and put it over here. So this equals tangent squared then. There's a better way of doing this, and I'll show you in a moment, but you could automatically substitute it that way. As is often the case, especially with identities, there may be several ways to get to the answer. And really, ultimately, do whatever you feel most comfortable or what is most intuitive to you, because that is a blessing, right? Your intuition. Don't fight it, right? So it really is a blessing to be intuitive, all right? I'm doing it probably the more complicated way. So that's how much of a squirrel brain that I have. <laughs> so don't feel bad, you know. I'll show you the easier way in a minute. Okay. Now, um, if meanwhile you have this thing down here, secant squared theta, let me just say I put the two on the outside as well. Like that. All right. I could do the same thing with this two. And then I have Two things that um, are being squared. And um, then I can encapsulate them like this. The two is here. I'm going to try to convert everything to sines and cosines. Right. Tangent can be converted via ratio, uh, pardon me, quotient identity. Secant can be converted via the uh, reciprocals. Right. So I'm going to use the reciprocal here. I'm going to use the quotient here, identities. So in the case of tangent, it's the ratio of sine over cosine. In the case of secant, secant is, since it's down here on the bottom, right, it would be cosine above the line like so. Right. 
space at this point. And that knee is at the tangent. You have sine of theta over the cosine of theta. And for secant, it really is the reciprocal of that would be cosine. Meanwhile, these are all being squared. What's going to happen to the cosines once again? They will cancel, and you're left with sine squared of theta is equal to itself. Now, the alternative way of doing this um, would be to take the original thing, and instead of factoring it so much, um, treat it as if you were dealing with fractions. So you'll see this. I'm going to put back the original problem and then show you the alternative. Secant squared of theta minus 1 over secant squared of theta. If you treat this more as if they were fractions, right? And the advantage to doing that would be that there's going to be an immediate cancellation effect. If these have a common denominator of, C, of secant squared, right, that is one fraction by itself and that will reduce to one. And this is a second fraction by itself. So minus 1 over secant squared. It's an ugly, complicated, trigonometric common denominator, but that is the case. Right? And this is all still on the left side. Right? This would reduce to something divided by itself, even if it's ugly and complicated, 99.9% of the times is just 1. Right? The exception being if you have a 0 here as a denominator, you go to math hell. If you try to do that, don't do that. Right? This is something you could put as being squared above the line and below the line. So, <clears throat> this would be, according to the uh, quotient to power rule in reverse, 1 over secant of theta squared, All right? which itself is a reciprocal. Secant is really what? Secant is really cosine, right? Is the reciprocal identities, they're calling, again, they're hodgepodge here called fundamental, but the ones, the examples with the one as the numerator here, they're reciprocals. These here are quotients, right? Sine and cosine ratios. Secant is one over cosine or vice versa. So if you manipulated this by multiplying by cosine here, and cosine here, and then dividing by secant here, and then putting it here, they'll switch, right? The bottom line is that this ends up being cosine of theta. And that is the Pythagorean identity. Just written, rearranged, right? One minus cosine, is sine squared, which is itself. That's a bit more efficient, I think. Wasn't my immediate intuition, but it's one, it's an example of where there's potentially more than one way to do the problem. So again, do what is most intuitive to you because that is a blessing, but just realize that ultimately you probably have options. So best to take advantage when you can. Okay. Now here's an example of where they're not telling you what it equals, but you're going to create an identity to me is kind of setting yourself up for failure as an instructor. You, you gave that instruction, you know, 
because then somebody go, well, you know, I can draw a happy face on one side and go, voila, I created it, you know. Be more specific than that. <laughs> Create an identity, yeah, just that one that is reasonable, not that is silly, all right. Create an identity. So what you'll see is something like this. Two times the tangent of theta is the secant uh, times the secant of theta. And this is not specified what it equals. Right? You are still gonna kind of confine yourself to the left, arguably more complicated because we don't know what this is, uh, side of the equation. Right? You're basically just gonna be given this expression, this half here, all right? And bear in mind the instruction whether explicitly stated or not, when they say create an identity, is to try to do this. Convert it to strictly sines and cosines, all right? Nothing funny, you don't go like, oh, yeah, there I go. <laughs> There's my creation, you know? Give my creation life, you know? Like Frankenstein. All right, so let's uh, try the old tricks here. I put some dots, which is kind of giving it away, but if you're going to factor, this is as it would factor immediately. Even this too would technically factor right that, like that, like that, like this. It's kind of overkill, but so be it. Tangent, right, can be converted to sines and cosines immediately because of the quotient identity. It's the ratio of sine over cosine. There's this two here. Secant, um, let's see. Secant is a reciprocal identity we would employ here, which just having gone through that is really one over cosine. So the objective of make, transforming this into something ex just strictly in sines and cosines is basically already done. Just uh, merge it, you know? Treat it like a fraction times a fraction, so a top times a top and a bottom times a bottom. And if it were possible, it isn't in this case, to cross-simplify, then do so. This is the result. 2 times sine of theta over the more concisely written way of writing this, cosine squared. And that's the goal. Um, if you take it one step further, you could just go maybe just one or the other, you know? So let's just say that you wanted to convert this exclusively to sines, all right? Then cosine square of theta is part of the Pythagorean identity, right? And so that would be one minus sine square of theta. They really should specify that they want you to do that. If that is uh, the ultimate goal. Right. This is strictly signs. This is a hodgepodge of those two, signs and cosines. Progressively uglier and uglier. But we're not going to sweat it because we have tools. We have fire, okay? So as long as we have fire, we're safe. Right? Which sounds very militaristic, I'm sorry to say, it, but that's human nature, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Now, with technology, will save us, hopefully. <laughs> 
just did my neighbor. Okay, sine squared with a negative input minus cosine squared with a negative input. Red alert, red alert, even odd function identi uh, identities, yes. All right, what is this equal? Um, well, it is hopefully going to simplify down to <clears throat> cosine of theta minus the sine of theta. I'm sorry that I'm writing this so tiny. Right, we want to reduce this blue ugly stuff into just that uh, single tier of trig functions, cosine minus sine. Alright, so. Um, Negative input. I, this is overkill, but it just makes me more comfortable. When I see an exponent of 2 here, put it on the outside so it's there. All right. Same thing. All right. That is the fancy way of writing it. This is reality. Right? It is not part of the function. It's not in the guts of the argument. It's really outside. So you would be squaring an outcome, really. Now, according to even odd uh, identities, all right, sine is an example of which sine is an odd function, which means that even if you have a negative input, you're going to get a positive out. Uh, pardon me. Even let me point to here rather than stumble. Sign with a negative input, it becomes a negative output because it isn't odd. see here, right, is to simply say negative sign with a regular positive input now. Right. Cosine, on the other hand, is an example of an even function. So what you see here is still going to spitefully be um, well, it will end, no, I should say spitefully. It's going to end up being the same result as if you had a positive outcome. So, if you want to put a plus here, I would simply not do it. I would just neglect to write it, take advantage of the option that we have. This is independent, mindly, uh, mind you, of what we have here and here. This is still a 2 here, this is still a 2 here, and there's still this minus in between. Right. And I'm just sticking with the top here. Right. I'm going to come back and deal with the bottom later. Now, what happens if at this point you then apply the exponent of 2 to each of the parts now, and now technically it has a coefficient of one. That will become a positive, right? And this is just sine squared of theta. Right? In this case, and this is not being affected, this two is not going to affect this uh, negative that is on the outside because that is what was originally there, all right? Um, this would be cosine squared of theta. And there is again this minus that keeps getting carried through here. Minus. And this is still just the tippy top of this. Again, it might have been an alternative way to get from here to here, but this is what occurred to me personally. Now, again, I'm going to refer you back to um, factoring techniques. 
look at what you have. You have, even though they're trigonometric, you have something being squared minus something being squared, right? So it's the difference of two things squared. So if you wanted to take that, right? And now we're gonna start from a squared minus b squared. We could factor it like this instead. The last time we had invoked this, it was starting with the binomials, right? And compacting it into that one binomial, okay? Now we're starting with something, an uglier derivative of this, and we're gonna write it that way, okay? So, what is written here can be written as if it were two binomials. I don't wanna make it look like a denominator, but it's not. This is still a numerator. If this is A and this is B, then this is just sine of theta, sine of theta, and cosine of theta, and cosine of theta. And in one instance, in order to be the difference of two squares, is that one is added and one is subtracted. That is the uh, ideal way to, uh, form of this. Believe it or not, because the, the junk that is still floating around the bottom here, namely this stuff here, this is probably going to help us induce a cancellation effect eventually. I'm gonna have to erase this, and I'm going to then manipulate just the denominator, essentially. So, this stuff on the top, I'll just erase. And what is immediately underneath it here? Go slow, always, when you're doing things like this, and don't be afraid to write something. I think a lot of people, especially generationally, have been, have been discouraged from physically writing things, and that is terrible, especially when you're trying to derive something mathematically. Write your thoughts, because your thoughts are letting somebody else see your mind. Right, writing them. How else could we see inside your head? Okay. I think I need a tissue, so humor me in one moment. Right, this is the numerator now. And this ugly stuff I've encapsulated too many times with marker is the denominator still. Let me get a tissue. And no, that was my door, I'm sorry. Excuse getting water too. Um, all right, we have a similar situation here. All right, as when we started, negative input. All right, sine is an odd function. The result of this being an odd function of odd identity is that it will make a negative output like that. Okay. Um, when we have deal with the cosine portion of this, all right? At least from here to here, if I just encapsulate this for a moment, this is gonna be an even identity. And the effect, even in spite of having a negative input, is that you end up with a positive output. So the whole thing would be positive. Now, it just so happens that there's a negative here. So this is getting carried down. Right? But not because of what is the fact that it's even. All right? Really, this is what the result that you see in red here is a result of it being an even identity. Negative input becomes positive, and then the output becomes positive. Right? This just gets carried down. What you can do here is um, perhaps factor out the negative 
this is technically a coefficient of one, this is technically a coefficient of one, so factor out negative one. And what you would get is a negative one out in front, just written one time, one written once, sine of theta plus cosine of theta. Right. And now you can see that there's going to be a cancellation effect. Right. I need this space, so, well, I might be able to get away with it, let me see. If I duplicate what is written in black here, I'm just gonna write this here in blue. The binomial factor, factors sine plus cosine of theta times the binomial factor sine minus cosine of theta. And this is meanwhile all sitting above the line my blue is done. Um, and now I'll take what is written in black here and write that as red. One times the sine of theta plus the cosine of theta. You see that there in the completely factored form, there is something that could be canceled out, right? The positive incarnations, if you will. So this whole factor and this whole factor would cancel. It would essentially be dividing something by itself. So the result is one without really having consciously to explicitly state that. All right. Now, uh, now I'm definitely going to have to erase. The effect is this. What are we left with? Sine minus cosine in a factor. And technically, negative one. Now, what would happen if you more or less distributed negative one to each of these parts? Negative one assigned to this would be negative sine of theta. And a negative assigned to a negative cosine would produce a positive cosine of theta. On the, the opposite side of this original problem, we have cosine written in front only for the reason stylistically that it is the positive. So if you just change the position, cosine of theta minus sine of theta we have verified that this is this. Right. That is the result. Um, now what you will see, this is technically the eighth, uh, well, that's the seventh example, but yeah, I'm not going to label it at this point. Um, if you were going to write a trig equation as if it were, at least a portion of it was, uh, expression to be technical. 
expression as if it were an algebraic expression. Um, this to me, though, it hadn't been explicitly stated. It is remarkably similar to U substitution, so I'm going to sort of remind you of that. If something seems quadratic, and remember, in order for it to be quadratic, it would be degree two, all right? And it would be a trinomial, all right? Then under normal circumstances, what we would use is U substitution. Remember, U substitution is basically disguising the complicated parts of an equation, all right? Just so you don't get distracted by them. Right, so the criteria in order to use this would be this. Right. Um, all right, in black maybe. Yeah. You have something that is a trinomial. In this case, it can't by definition be an algebraic function because it's a transcendental function. Okay. Right. Um, so I'm going to just simply say trinomial-esque, right? meaning three terms, you know. Number two, um, there is nothing but the same basis. Anything that has an exponent has the same basis. The third term is a constant. And then as far as the, the exponents are concerned, degree of the first is double uh, degree of the second. Is that in the frame? Looks like it is. So I'm going to give you the actual example, finally. If you had um, something like this, 2 cosine squared of theta plus the cosine of theta minus 1. You're not going to really solve an equation today, but the technique of writing a trig function as if it was an algebraic function will allow us eventually to factor it. So that's really why we're just trying to get acclimated to doing that. We're going to try to use factoring techniques eventually. Anyhow, let's see if this uh, passes criteria here. Is it trinomial-esque? Yeah, it's three terms, you know, things separated by pluses or minuses. Are the things with the exponents the same base? That's exponent of 2. This would technically be exponent of 1. They're both bases are cosines, so yeah. The third term is a constant. It is. It's a 1. And then the degree of the first should be double the degree of the second. So if this is 2, that is double 1. So it's all good. Um, what we could do is just simply say, well, if it was u substitution, then we would use a u. All right? But if you want to be even plainer than that, you could just say, well, in place of cosine, I'm just going to put x. So therefore, in place of cosine squared, it's going to be x squared. Yeah. And that means that this 2 is still on the front here. There's still a plus in between, and there's still a minus. Right. This is really the objective, disguising something because it might be easier to factor. It really depends on the person, really, you know, how you feel about it, I suppose. But it is arguably easier to factor. And the reason that we want to factor is because we would use that as a technique to solve. 
if it was part of an equation, you know. Right now it isn't, it's just a free floating expression, but if you put equals here and then some of the junk on the opposite side, the opposite side then you might want to try to do that. Right. How would this factor? Um, I would try AC product pairs as a technique here, which is again for reference. Remember AC product pairs in factor in tandem with factoring by grouping is taking a trinomial and actually making it longer because ironically when you do that you just have to pay attention to two terms at once. And it's easier to factor two terms at once rather than three. Right. Essentially, what's going to happen, you call this A and you call this C, is you do two times one and you get two. And so your AC product would be just two. And then the only factors of that would be one and two. Usually you do that for something more complicated than just low numbers like that, but that is the process. All right, and then you take 2x squared plus 1x, essentially here, minus 1, and you split the middle here into those two factors, the ones that you choose out of the list. So it would be convenient in this case to use 2 and use 1x. And then you just drop what is next to it here, 2x squared, and minus 1 here. And then you decide what the signs are. If you want this to shrink, basically, from 2 to 1, right? you would have to use subtraction. What causes subtraction is the combination of signs that is one of each, right? meaning one has to be negative and one has to be positive. That causes subtraction. If you want the outcome to be positive, then the larger thing has to be positive, and then you would have it like so. Like so. The effect then is that if you have 2x squared plus 2x minus 1x minus 1, is that you only have to pay attention to two things at once when you're factoring uh, a GCF. They both have an X, so that would be in common. You write it outside of parentheses. Coincidentally, they both have a two. Two X times what would be two X squared? X. Two X times what would be itself? Positive one. When you shift focus to these two, they don't have a letter in common, but they both have negative one in common. Negative 1 times what is negative 1x? Just x. Negative 1 times what is itself? Positive 1. And because this and this are the same, then the fact is are 2x plus, uh, pardon me, 2x, write it in a different color because it's too much on top of itself. It's what is the same. times the left outs. Right. That same factor, I usually just say it's it's a match, you know. The match gets its one parentheses, x plus one, and the left outs are the things literally on the left and on the outside. So two x minus one. Okay. Now where where does that leave us in terms of the um, um the actual trig function. You can, if you need to, back substitute or reverse the u substitution so that it has incorporates you know cosine, which is what it really was. Right? I had said before, standing in place of a, a cosine is x. So that means that what you would have is whether you see an x is really a cosine. Cosine of theta plus one, and two times the cosine of theta 
uh, minus one would be the factor for one. All right. If you FOIL it, you should get the original expression. All right. Two, uh, pardon me, cosine times two cosine is two cosine squared of theta. Cosine of theta times negative one is negative cosine of theta. One uh, times two cosine is plus two cosine of theta. And positive one times negative one is negative one. What happens to this joke in the middle is that you subtract. They are like terms because they're both base cosine and they're both um, um, <clears throat> the same degree. They're both cosine to the first. So you subtract two minus one and you get positive cosine. Okay. Having something facted like this as if it was algebraic would be useful again if you were solving an equation. That's really the point of it. And even though they're not calling it U substitution and I used an X instead of a U, that is really what it is, that process. Textbook had an error. So mine is correct and they for wrong forms. Okay. It happens. There's always sign issues, right? Unless I invented a problem and I just didn't duplicate it correctly. Yeah, it looks right. and then I'll stop. Um, here's another thing that you might factor algebraically. sine squared of theta, and this is just a free-floating expression again, and we're going to try to factor algebraically. Why? Because it is a little bit warmer, a little bit fuzzier, in theory, algebra is familiar, right? So, um, this is not quite um, something that is trinomial, certainly, this is a binomial, but look at what you have. Let's start with manipulating the uh, notation here. This is squared, but it's not in it's not in the input, right? It's the function output that in theory would be squared. So this could be alternatively written like so, right? Theta is the input, you know? It's the output, the effect of cosine on theta that is being squared. So four here, and there's a minus one. It would be good in the long run to have certain information memorized. For example, you know that 4 is a perfect square, 
So simultaneously, four could be written as two squared. And then you have the, and one as well. One is also a perfect square. So this is minus one squared. These two uh, factors, the two squared and the cosine squared, can be more or less uh, regrouped, right? Like this, right? The legal justification for doing what I'm doing right now, just to write it as these two things squared into, you know, just written once rather than twice, is from rules of exponents, which again is why I incorporated this as part of the packet, right? It is basically the product to power rule in reverse. Normally, uh, you start with two things grouped together and there's an exponent on the outside. But what if you had started with two things, different bases, you know, um, sitting next to each other multiplied, right? You could rewrite them backwards like this. This is officially the product of power rule, right? So writing it like that, and then adjacent to this one, which is also the perfect square, you again might recognize that the, the result, which I'm encapsulating right now, is itself something that could be factored further. This is the difference of two squares model. You could change this out for an X if you feel more comfortable. But it is the difference, the, the being subtracted, of two things grouped, encapsulated in red, encapsulated in blue, being squared. Right? So, how does it factor? It factors like this. Right? If this is your A and this is your B, then it's A plus B times A minus B, according to the old difference model. Right. It's just that it is now more complicated A's. Right. So two cosine of theta and two cosine of theta and a nice simplistic one for your B. Plus one, minus one. And again, if you wanted to, you could just substitute cosine with the letter X. Right, you wouldn't be able to let a U if you wanted right, to get this far. Right. Anyhow, we are trying to factor things because when we get to section 9.5, which is next Tuesday, we're going to actually solve. Which means this will be part of some equation and having something in a factored form is a technique for solving equations. Okay? Let me stop with here like that. And we'll move on. All right. Mm -hmm. um, today is Thursday. So for homework, um, please do uh, section 9 1 practice. In my open math, All right, let's say it is due next Thursday. Okay, and that's it. Thank you guys. Uh, it's very cold. <laughs> I'm gonna go inside now and light a fire. All right, I'll see you on uh, Tuesday. Be careful out there.